Okay, uh, I think we can get started. Um, so hello everyone, welcome to our first guest speaker session uh, for Highlander Engineering Club. Uh, today uh, we have Professor Dato with us uh, today who is a professor from the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department from the University of Waterloo. Uh, and he's come here to speak to us uh, about a few things which we'll be talking about uh, later. But for those of you who are new here, uh, this is Highlander uh, Engineering Club. So Highlander Engineering Club is a club that is centered around one of the most popular fields in the world, uh, engineering. And we work to develop valuable skills and experiences that will be beneficial in future education and employment environments. And regardless of your experience, so if you're a beginner or very experienced, we welcome you with open arms. So come down and learn something new with us. We will be in person uh, starting next week again. Uh, so a little bit about uh, what the professor will be talking about today. Uh, so he'll go over a quick introduction about himself and uh, how he went into this career, a little bit of software and correctness, how to understand programs, the future outlook, what it is like in university at the University of Waterloo, and a small Q&A session at the end for 20 minutes. Um, and that's it. So uh, let, I think you can get started with uh, Professor Benzo. Okay, thanks for the introduction and thanks everyone for coming. I'll talk a little bit about programming language software and software engineering research. And usually in my lectures, I start with a joke about my Austrian accent and say that I sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But then my partner reminded me that uh, most of you probably don't know Schwarzenegger. And if I say that I start looking more and more like Danny DeVito, the joke is all, probably also lost on most of you. So I'll try not to do too much. How do you do fellow kids? Will not have any more memes other than this and talk a little bit about my journey in programming languages and software engineering research and why I think this field is so fascinating. Let me quickly check whether you all hear me okay. I didn't ask that in the beginning. Do yeah, you hear me? Yeah. You can. Perfect. Okay. So a little bit about my background. I come from Salzburg, Austria, a nice tourist town in Salz in the Mountain Republic of Austria. I did my PhD in computer science at ETH Zurich in Switzerland, right next door. Then I did a postdoc at the University of Washington in Seattle. And since 2013, I'm here as first an assistant professor and since last year as an associate professor. In between, in 2017, I spent seven months at Google in Mountain View, which was a, a purely industrial experience. So I spent a long time in acad academia and I love computer science research. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about why I find this field so fascinating and why I think you should also spend some time in it. I hopefully don't have to convince you that software is a part of daily life. Everything runs of software. The way we have this presentation is only possible because we have this fascinating software. The big question is, why is building software hard? And so maybe you can think a little bit about your experience in writing software so, so far and what makes it hard or challenging. So a few points here are that software development is a relatively young field. And so the discipline itself started um, less than 100 years ago, more realistically, 60, 50 years ago. And the uh, user expectations are huge. If you watch any movie, you see how the detectives zoom into a grainy picture and get clear fingerprints out of a, a cell phone camera picture. And the other big problem with software is that it is always embedded in some environment. You cannot run software independently. Software is just ideas. And it always runs on some hardware and interact with the physical world in some way. So one distinction that people make about these difficulties in building software are the distinction between incidental difficulties and essential difficulties. The incidental difficulties are from poor understanding, where you just didn't understand the problem well enough and just need to spend more time in breaking down your problem into something that's more manageable. The essential difficulties are more interesting because they're just fundamental problems that you cannot really overcome. The biggest problem here is mathematical complexity. There are certain algorithms, some of which you might have heard of already, like the traveling salesman's problem, 
where you um, just don't, you have a theoretical lower bound on the complexity and you just cannot do a problem faster. And with the data size growing continuously, it becomes just theoretically impossible to do certain tasks faster. Complexity, but also just in the sheer size of software. Um, software started out in just a few hundred lines that you needed for a simple addition algorithm to now millions of lines of code that you need to run a car, to run an airplane. Um, I mentioned a little bit the conformity before, depending on what domain you're in, if it's finance, if it's medicine, if it's um, planes, you have a lot of regulations that you need to um, conform to and that make it difficult to write correct software. The perceived changeability of software is another thing that um, makes software development difficult because it is indeed very simple to change a single line of code, but understanding the impact of that simple change is, can be very hard. So um, making that compromise between a small change somewhere and uh, understanding what the impact on the overall system is can be very hard. Another problem with software that in particular for beginners is really hard is seeing software as, as a real thing, understanding how you have this text in front of you, which gets converted into an executable that then finally runs on the physical hardware. And that you cannot really look on into something and understand what's going on. You don't have any um, wheels um, that you see turning. You have to look and have multiple levels of abstraction that you need to see through to understand how a particular program behaves. So what did people come up with to um, solve these um, complexities? The area that I'm fascinated with is high-level programming languages. So people used to program these huge physical machines with electrical tubes and punch hole cards. And now we have very high level, sometimes even graphical programming languages that allow you to tell the computer what they need to do. So raising this level of abstraction from the very physical, close to the bare metal level to now being nearly interacting with another human where you talk and describe your problem and convince the computer um, how to um, do the tasks that you're interested in. We also made huge um, benefits in development environments. So how do you interact with the computer? As I said before, you have these punch hole cards and now it's like a text editor where you get um, grammar support, where the computer tells you what you wrote here is probably not the right thing. So this interaction cycle um, with the computer got much easier. Component-based reuse is maybe a bit more an abstract concept. You can think of it like um, the Lego pieces that you have to build your Lego models. And you can just pick standard pieces and reuse those to write your own applications. So instead of always having to come up with the individual small pieces yourself, you can use these existing components to write new software. And that's also taken off in the last several um, years only that we do this on the internet scale, that you can really interact and connect different components written in different programming languages that all interact with each other, allowing you to reuse huge amounts of knowledge. But there are also human aspects like development strategies, how you attack problems, how do you break a problem down so that you can make sure that thousands of people can work on a single project. So we have more incremental processes, more evolutionary approaches, how you can interact with um, the software to make sure that you develop something really large on schedule on, and on budget. The final point is also more about how you design your software. So a lot of um, recent focus has been on human computer interaction. How do you even interact with a computer so that it makes sense for normal people to interact with it? So computers are no longer just for nerds that like to hack um, binary code. It becomes much more useful by everyday, for everyday people. And this focus on design and how to solve problems that actual users have made this possible. 
So I want to talk a little bit about one quality attribute. So in one of my lectures, I talk about different aspects of software development and what makes uh, computer codes um, beautiful. And one important aspect is simplicity. And there's this famous quote by Tony Ho, one of uh, the very famous computer scientists, who talks about two ways of constructing a software. One is to make it so simple that there are obviously no deficiencies. The other one is to make it so complicated that there are no obvious deficiencies. And to make it as simple as possible is far more difficult. It's much easier to write very complicated code where you just add some additional class, some additional condition to your code to handle a particular case. But to really think through what the logic is of your problem and how you can decompose your system into small, reusable, understandable components. That's the fundamental problem in software engineering. So here are two other terms that people use for this. This don't repeat yourself, keeping your code dry, that you only want to write um, some logic once in a particular um, module, and then you want to reuse that module. You don't want to repeat yourself all over the code because repetition leads to errors. The other one that you might have heard in other contexts is keep it simple, stupid, to make things simple to understand. If you make it simple enough for you to write it correctly, somebody else who has to read your code will also be able to, to understand it, or has a higher chance of being able to understand it. So what I like about this is that it's not really so specific to computer science. It applies in many other domains where you have a complex problem and you need to break it down into smaller pieces. And so this idea of simplicity and beauty, understanding how you develop software, how you break down a larger project, I think is one of the most beautiful and fascinating things in computer science. Um, when I prepared that lecture, I, I, I found this quote from Blaise Pascal, where he wrote in a letter, I think, to his father, I only made this letter longer because I didn't have time to make it shorter. You probably have this experience from writing essays in, in some assignments. It's usually much easier to wander on and repeat your points, make redundant um, comments, make contradictory comments in, in your prose. And you have the same problems in your so software. You can just make too many statements that in the end contradict each other. And you can have all these kinds of logical problems in your code. And so what I'm interested in is how can we make programming languages stronger and give um, better guarantees to software developers. So maybe one term that you heard in software is uh, the bug. And so that's maybe a very strange term for you to hear because when you make a, a spelling mistake in an essay, nobody will say you have a bug in your essay. So this term comes from the 1947 here where somebody found an actual math in a relay of one of these really old computers where everything was still with physical relays switching on and off. And they found a math which um, made a contact not work correctly, which led to a malfunction. And since then, um, computer scientists have been talking about bugs in, in their code. The problem is that over the last few decades, the impact of these bugs have become tremendously um, much larger. Here's the Ariane 5 rocket exploding on the maiden flight. There are many examples, and here I collected a few numbers about the costs of these um, software failures. So one estimate that I found from 2013 is that around 300 billions every year are wasted on software bugs. Um, probably also before any one of you was born, the Y2K problem. When we transitioned from 99 to 2000, the software industry had to spend $300 billion just making sure that this transition from 99 to 00, 00 in the date format worked correctly. There's a famous NAS Mars mission from 99 where a, a, a lander exploded or disintegrated on the surface of Mars, which cost the taxpayer 650 million. And it was all just because two units um, use different units. 
There's the Ariane 5 maiden flight that I showed a picture of where 500 millions were, um, go, went up in flames because two numbers were not com converted correctly. And there are many, many other examples about um, the high cost of software failures. But even more seriously, software bugs can cost lives. So many systems nowadays depend on software as an integral part for their operation. And if that software malfunctions, people can die. So in 1997, there was a, a chat crash because Vader software didn't notice a mountain in front of a chat, killing 225 people. There was a Patriot defense missile system that uh, had a rounding error, I think it was, uh, and that led to a death of 20, 28 people. There's a famous radiation therapy system from 1985, the Terec 25, that directly was attributed to a software failure and caused at least three deaths. And the numbers go on. So there are about a quarter of all medical device recalls in 2011 were only directly caused by software. So the importance of writing correct software making sure that we train software engineers that are responsible and understand how to write correct software is getting more and more important. And so that's the topic that, that my research focuses on. So in this graph, I talk a little bit about um, ways to guarantee software correctness. So on the y-axis, I have the strength of the guarantees that you get about the behavior of your software. And on the y-axis, I talk a little bit, very roughly, about the practicality of the approach. So the first approach that you might um, experience yourself is just code reviews. So code reviews can actually be all over um, the coordinates here, because you can have very rigorous code reviewing practices, like they do, for example, at NASA, where you really have to go line by line through your code with a human. Many more industrial environments probably do peer review where some other engineer has to go through your code, but the guarantees that you get out of that um, are very weak. So in the end, you are human trying to understand what the computer does, and you're usually hopelessly lost. The other approach that you hopefully or maybe have heard of is testing. This is very widely used in industry to various degrees of automation. So testing executes particular test cases, many times just the test, test cases that you wrote, but there are also automatic test case generation tools that make it easier to more comprehensively test your software. So this is a very practical approach to software correctness, but it doesn't give you very strong guarantees usually because it only tests existing test cases that you have it doesn't test, it cannot test all possible executions. So here is where formal verification comes in. Formal verification is a mathematical approach to model all possible behaviors of a software and really give you a mathematical guarantee that nothing can go wrong. You really want every possible integer, every possible behavior of your software should be modeled by the computer and exhaustively ensured that it behaves as you expect. So the obvious, um, so what I work on are type systems, which are a lightweight, practical way of giving you certain guarantees about your software. The standard type systems are not very strong, and my research focuses on making type systems more practical and giving you stronger guarantees. So the goal, obviously, is to get to the top right on this chart, have a practical tool that normal developers can use that give you a very strong guarantee about the correctness of your software. So the programming language that I use mostly is Java, uh, a higher level managed programming language that has a nice static type system that helps you prevent many errors. So you will never um, be able to assign a string to an integer and get an invalid computation when you try to add that integer because it tries to convert that string into a number. And in Java, you have a compiler that once tells you that something goes wrong here and you never even get to execute the code. 
The thing is that the type system that Java provides and many other programming language provide doesn't give you very strong guarantees. So it prevents certain mistakes from happening, but it doesn't give you guarantees for properties that are very interesting in practice. So here I have three simple examples. The first one calls this method read line on a console. And if the developer tests the code, it always worked. But then they ship the code to their customer and the system crashes. The reason is that this console might not be attached. And then in Java, there's this best special value, the null value, which can um, be returned for every reference type. And this console method returns null whenever there is no console attached. And so the developer never tested for this condition. And then the system compiled. For the compiler, everything looks OK. But then at one time, the system crashes with an exception. Second example is about mutability, where you try to add an element to an empty list. But in this particular collection framework, lists are immutable. So you cannot add elements to a list. The third one are the maybe famous um, SQL injection attacks, where you take user input and directly pass it to your database engine, which can use uh, can lead to uh, many bad behaviors, like deleting all your database entries. So how can we improve on this? Here's a very simple piece of code where we have a method op that takes some input data and converts that to a string. And this can lead to a null point exception. If you invoke this method op with this null value, you directly dereference the input, and that leads to a null point exception. The big question here is whose fault is it? Is it an implementation problem with this method op, or should that method never be invoked with this null value? And at the moment in Java, there is no way of encoding this other than in, in English in the documentation for the method op. But the compiler doesn't help you with this. So what we want is a stronger type system that allows the developer to express these properties, whether a reference can be null, so we'll refer to that special null value, or is non-null, meaning that it can never refer to the special value. So this is a simple example of a type system that adds this additional information to your existing type system, allowing you to enforce stronger properties about your program. So in a nutshell, my research program is to make type systems more expressive and more practical, leading closer to this top right. Clearly, this diagram is very simplistic. In research, we are very happy with very tiny increments to everything. So unfortunately, we're still very far away from reaching that top right corner. So a few years ago, I worked on the Java 8 extended annotation syntax, making it possible that developers can use these annotations in their Java source code to specify the correct behavior of their source code. So here, they can say they have a non-null list, uh, list of non-null strings. They can cast something to an immutable graph or they can say that this unmodifiable list implements this read-only list. So you have these special at annotations, which provide additional information for the compiler. And then the compiler, by default, just stores that in the class file, outputs it in documentation, and so on. And I've worked on this tool called the Checker Framework, which takes this extra information in the source code and enforces a type system. So this is called a pluggable type checker because you extend the existing type system with these additional checks to get stronger guarantees about your behavior. So I applied this in quite a few different domains. One is the static program analysis for reliable trusted apps. As you can imagine, mobile phones are very security sensitive. You have them on, on your person all the time. 
and they can listen to you all the time. So in this project, I worked on a security type system that tells you whether an application reads certain information and where it sends that information to. Um, mobile phones are also important for verification because updating applications takes data and certain, develop, uh, certain users might not update the application. And if it crashes, it might take them a long time before they can actually update and get a fixed version. So mobile phones, embedded systems also are quite interesting for form of verification where you have additional restrictions on the hardware and you usually have very sensitive operations. Another project that I worked on was crowdsourced verification, where we tried to model this mathematical process of software verification as a game that people can play at a bus stop. And the idea was that um, people, humans, are very good at certain problems, solving mathematical puzzles without realizing it. And computers can be very bad at seeing large scales pattern in data. And so in this project, we tried using human intuition, human representation of problems to solve mathematical problems. So for program verification, I think it did not quite work out, but for other domains, in particular for medical um, research, this actually worked out um, with a tremendous success where people play protein folding games that allow you to find new drugs um, uh, more easily than a computer could. One more recent project was about mining and understanding software enclaves, which was about um, large scale software repositories, where we have millions of lines of code, which are available on the internet for free, and looking at that code and seeing certain patterns, certain bug fixes that happen, or security violations that happen. And in this project, we wanted to look at type systems that help you to understand large scale software and how to um, make it easier to maintain. And my most recent work was published just last month or two or three weeks ago, which is about scalability and precision by combining type systems and verification where we actually described in a more rigorous way what this relationship is between pluggable type systems and this more formal mathematical verification of software. And one of the few good things of the pandemic and the lockdown is that a lot of these conferences now record videos of their presentations. So you can actually go to these links and um, look at the conference talk and see um, what this talk is about. Okay, so in a nutshell, my research is about how to make reliable and secure pro programming possible in practice by developing lightweight stag static analysis tools, in particular type systems. So usually in a scientific talk, we talk about some formalizations where you actually also formalize these lightweight type systems. So these type systems are supposed to be easy to use for software developers, but we still want mathematical guarantees about their correctness. So we formalize these type systems and have a mathematically rigorous model of what guarantees we actually get. And we want um, so-called soundness, meaning if we say that, for example, you never run into a null point exception, the type system actually gives you that guarantee. Okay, so this just gives you a small glimpse in the kind of research that I work on. I think programming language and software engineering recently has, has become very popular because more and more people learn programming and see how can they interact with computers and people have ideas of how can we make this easier. So there are um, programming languages on the novice side, making beginner programming possible, and also on the expert side, where we have programming language dedicated for low level um, programming environments that need stronger guarantees. 
And so there has been a lot of cool development in the programming language and software engineering community. And computer science in general is a very varied field with lots of problems. We don't cure cancer. We don't um, work on the climate change. But computer science helps in many of these domains. Without computers, you could not develop a new drug. Without computers, you wouldn't understand. You couldn't model climate change. So computer science is this enabling technology that just allows you to understand the physical world better. And so there are tons of different problems. I listed a few here. Energy efficiency, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning. You've definitely heard of that. There are people from humanities that look at all the social issues, in particular with AI and ML, about how we apply computers in society, in law, um, for banking, all these different domains. Humanities and law need to understand um, what the implications of that are. And more design things like human computer interaction. How can you make it easier to navigate, interact with a computer? No code programming, this beginner friendly programming, synthesizing new code where you have maybe just examples and the computer actually generates additional code for you. Hardware architectures. So, as I said before, software doesn't exist in isolation. And the people on the electrical side um, in my department make huge, tremendous efforts in minimizing, making chips smaller and smaller, faster and faster. And we need better ways in taking advantage of this fast hardware. Networking, the internet, how can we make sure that remote areas in Canada are reachable by 5G networks? Algorithms, I mentioned that in the beginning that we have these complexity bounds and there are still people developing faster search algorithms, sorting algorithms, and for many new quantum algorithms. And computer science for X, um, bioinformatics, um, statistics, all these different domains where you need computer science as an enabling technology and you need scientists from both sides, people that understand the theory of computer science and people from these application domains. Um, you might have heard the term computational thinking, this idea that um, understanding how algorithms work, how computer work has become this basic enabling technology in many different domains. Okay, so maybe at a different speed, what do I do all day as a professor? Officially, I have three um, jobs and these are research, teaching and service. On the research side, it's very hard to really say what it is. It's thinking about interesting problems, reading other people's papers, understanding what problem they might have that I can help with. Acquiring funding is unfortunately a big part of it. Um, finding organizations that give you money so that I can hire students and then the students um, work on the actual research. Industry outreach is important for me because I like uh, applied research where I talk with actual software engineers in practice and try to get them and help them in developing better software. And then writing papers where we actually outline what, what the research results are and communicate that to other researchers. And that's the main currency in research, writing papers that other people cite and build their own research on. The second component is teaching, where we um, train the next generation of um, scientists. So we prepare and deliver lectures. We work with the teaching assistants, which are also usually grad students or advanced undergraduate students, and train them in how to be teachers. And then the one-on-one -on -one advising with our graduate students is, for me, the most enjoyable part of teaching, where you really work with an aspiring researcher and teach them how to become a better um, researcher. The third component we call service. It's ex internal and external committees. At the moment, I'm on an internal hiring committee where we try to hire new faculty members. And so you have meetings where you go through the CVs and see who would be a good colleague to hire. 
other service activities are outreach activities like your Ontario Universities Day, which I think was cancelled last year and probably this year, um, where the universities present their degree programs and why you should come to a particular university. So diversity and outreach is actually very important to me. Uh, with this May, I saw on the Highlander engineering slides that there were, I think, only guys on the picture. So women in computer science and engineering, unfortunately, is a very sore topic. Um, we have this very bad image that we are all coder pros and afraid of women. And everyone is working, at least at the university, very hard on changing this, encouraging women to get into science, into engineering. And as I said, we have such a wide field of possible research topics and we need all possible uh, backgrounds. Engineering in particular over the last few years worked very hard in outreach activities and um, also high school outreach activities. So you should definitely go to this engineering outreach page where you can see um, a few of the activities that we provide. Um, a brief thank you to the sponsors. As I said, one of the activities that I have is acquiring funding for my research. The main funder for me is the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada, which provides matching grants and discovery grants, which makes uh, most of my research possible. Then in 2019, I received the Ontario Early Researcher Award, which is from the government of Ontario for early promising researchers. And this enabled one large part of my research program. In the beginning, when I came from Washington, I also worked with the United States uh, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA, and I received a few gifts from Amazon and Google. And so, Thank you to all my sponsors and in particular, the taxpayers and the accountability that we have with reporting our research to the general public also to make them understand why our research is important and what impact it has on their daily lives. Okay, I think I'm pretty doing well on time. So thank you to Peter, Effie and the whole Highland Engineering Club for organizing this event and all of you for listening. I started with this um, movie recommendation of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Let me end with Wear Sunscreen. It's a song from 1997. Unfortunately, most of you probably haven't heard it. It's all the life advice I would want to tell you, um, but don't have the time to. So read through the lyrics of that song, listen to the song. It's a lot of fun. Okay. With that, I hope we have about 20 minutes for questions. Yeah, so uh, thank you for your presentation, uh, Professor. So we do have a few uh, pre-submitted uh, questions uh, from, our, from our forum. So the first question that we have is, uh, what advice do you have for students uh, looking into computer and electrical engineering to pr further pursue their uh, interests? Like, well, what advice uh, would you give them starting in high school um, as they go forward? Yeah. Um, so if you've looked at how the application process works, there is this um, student, in, student information form where you talk about your experience already. And so things like the High, Highlander Engineering Club and your work with computers already and that you have some programming experience. All these experiences are good for um, reporting that you're actually interested in this domain and that you have some clue that this might actually be the domain that you want to get into. And so doing extracurricular activities like an engineering club is definitely very useful for this, yeah. Uh, Peter, would you like to ask the next question? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so the next question is, I don't have any specific questions. Oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> the next question with that would be, what are the biggest advantages of UW engineering programs? How does an on-campus recruitment work? So what are the biggest benefits of what? Uh, the UW engineering. So, oh, yeah. okay. So okay. the biggest 
uh, the thing that Waterloo is famous for is the cooperative education program. So we have a mix between the academic terms and the co-op terms where you actually go to industry. And so I think Waterloo was the first university in Canada, or at least it's the biggest university in Canada that offers that cooperative education program. You have that both in computer science and in electrical and computer engineering. And there is um, just the experience that you get from, so there are two options, either after the first term you go to industry or after the second term you go to industry, and then you alternate between going to industry or having an academic on-campus term. And so you really get real world experience by going to companies like Google, Amazon, startups in Silicon Valley, and um, you really get real world experience in software development. So, and that's pretty much, I think, for all engineering programs. So in the faculty engineering, chemical engineering, all these disciplines have this code program. I think in many of the other departments on campus, there's also a co-op option. Um, I think that's the um, biggest selling point for Waterloo. It's one of the largest, strongest academic institutions in Canada. And this is the main um, factor for that people probably like about us. Oh, thank you. Um, and the next question is, uh, what is the importance of mentors in this field? Did you have any and what did they teach you? Yes, um, so that's a great question. Um, so in academia, we sometimes don't call them mentor, we call them the advisors. So when I did my first um, undergrad at my master's degree, I had a, a professor who was my advisor. When I did my PhD degree, I have a, a professor who was my PhD advisor. And so in academia, we are very used to having your teacher who's your mentor, your advisor. And it's just maybe different teachers you have different relationships with. And in academia, for this one-on-one -on -one relationship for a master thesis, a PhD thesis, it's a very much a mentoring relationship where you get feedback about your work, you, get, um, you produce something, your advisor reviews it, gives you comments about it, and you iteratively uh, improve your, your system. Um, but also in general, in industry, you see a lot of mentoring relationships and um, you have this idea of pair programming where you really develop software, not as a single person, but you do it in, in pairs where you develop software together so that you have more hands and uh, doesn't really help you with one keyboard, but more brains and more eyes looking at your software. That's also used as a mentoring uh, practice where a junior software engineer uh, pairs up with a senior software engineer to understand how to do something, understand how an API works, how you use a system. So mentoring in general, I think, is a very useful thing in academia and in industry. And, and I, I don't know about high school here, but I hope you have something like academic advisors that you can talk to about uh, course selection and things like that. So at university, you'll have academic advisors where you talk about your schedules, how to organize your day. And there's a lot of support about that, which is also all mentoring. Um, so another question is, do you think research in this field of computer engineering is beneficial at an uh, industry? Yes, uh, so absolutely. So uh, there's a lot of discussion here. So, so it's called software engineering, but nobody in industry really requires a professional engineering license. So there are for other engineering disciplines like um, construction and stuff, you actually need to be a licensed engineer. So in software, it's usually more whether you know how to do something. So you know how to develop a website, you learned HTML and JavaScript on your own, you can become a successful software engineer without requiring uh, engineering or computer science education. And maybe you don't need to understand an algorithm to do that. But I think understanding computer science really from the ground up, like you learn in a, at least an undergraduate education, greatly helps you and just allows you to really understand this whole stack from the hardware to the highest levels of the software. And you can do all of that by yourself. And there are huge discussions in academia about uh, these MOOCs, these massively online 
whatever the other OS um, courses, um, where you can just learn everything online on YouTube. And yeah, that's true. You can learn a lot uh, online, but the university provides a setting that helps you do that, do it in a particular structure, has all these other activities like core, has um, mentoring facilities. And so I think, well, I hope that most people want to come back to campus, that this online centric from the pandemic, it was good while it lasted, but at least I look forward to normal teaching again, where I can be on campus and actually see people. It's nice that I think there are 40 or so people here, but I just see icons. And so for only two of you, I actually see a face. And so it's much nicer if you come to a classroom, you see students without masks, and you can actually interact with people. It's much nicer than recording videos where you just talk to a blank wall. Okay, um, great. So, no. Go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so in summary, yes, I think academic education in computer science is still important. And in-person education, I think, is also still important. So there's lots of discussion about inverted curriculum, where you have some pieces as videos and more the on-hands experience on campus. So we'll see how all these things develop, but yeah. Okay, uh, so another question that we have is, um, by Ashley Mason is here, are there any gaps in skills that you're seeing from uh, the new students coming into uh, Waterloo or in your class? And is there something that you wish they would teach more in high school? Uh, since that is like uh, everyone here is in high school. So what would you say uh, people should learn more about or uh, what schools should teach more high schools, teach more to high school students? That's a really good question. And I unfortunately don't know the answer to it. So I'm actually teaching a first year um, electrical and computer engineering course in the fundamentals of programming. But unfortunately, it's happening during the pandemic. So the past two times I taught it. And so I have very little interaction with the students themselves. So I don't really get the feeling for what are they missing and what, what would high school, uh, what should high school teach more about? So I think having a basic feeling for uh, no fear from interacting with a computer, I think is probably uh, one good skill and just clear, rigorous thinking and as I said before, like computer science is just how to solve problems. And so writing good essays or writing a good report uh, is trains that same skill. You just break down a problem that you have and you write an essay about it. And so you train a lot of the same uh, critical reasoning skills that you also need for computer science. So um, yeah, so I, I, I can't really comment too much on, on what you do in high school. Okay, yeah, no worries. Uh, so another question uh, that we have is what is your future vision uh, with this uh, with this field with computer engineering or software engineering? Uh, where do you see it going forward um, for like starting from now or like in the late future or uh, early future? Um, just like what do you see going forward for this field? Yeah, that's another excellent question. So it's it's hard to tell. So it's um, artificial intelligent machine learning are to the two hot topics at the moment. And for the past 20 years, people say that AI will replace all software developers, that software developers are a dying breed because computers will program themselves. So far that hasn't happened because humans have unique insights in how to do things, how to structure problems, how to solve problems. And so making that easier for humans and raising that abstraction level, I think will continue to be an important research challenge. Lots of people look into synthesizing code. So using computers to help you program um, more automatically. And many people look into these more graphical interfaces where you don't actually touch code. I'm not so sure whether graphical interfaces are really the best. So I, I like text. Text is the most efficient way how you can communicate. And we don't draw essays, we write essays. And in mathematics, we have concise notation. Well, yes, we have diagrams in mathematics to express certain ideas. But just the written words, formulas, and code in software 
just make it possible to express your ideas in a concise way. Where the world leads, hopefully, hopefully to a better place. And hopefully software will help us get there. All right. Uh, yeah, so last but not least, we have uh, our final question. Uh, do you need to be strong uh, in math uh, to pursue a career in uh, computer engineering? Uh, for those like of us who are, who are not as like, confident in, the, in math, or like how, how important would you say that computer engineering uh, relates to math and that correlation in university and onwards? So in university, if you go to the EC department, math is important. And so you will have lots of um, first and second year courses where you need to be strong in math. In computer science in general, yes, mathematics is important because computer science in our university is part of the faculty of mathematics. So it is kind of a field of mathematics. So you kind of need to have this knack for how to think like a mathematician. But that doesn't mean that everyone needs to be super strong in mathematics. Like I talked about the social aspects of algorithm design, of um, AI algorithms, or human-computer interaction. So for a lot of these, you maybe you need statistics or something, but you don't need complex um, integrals or things like that. Well, maybe for statistics you do, but so for depending on what field of computer science you want to get in. Um, there is definitely also if you're not strong in mathematics, but then maybe you should um, focus on more on the social studies and do computer science as the minor. Um, so yeah, it, it depends on what your interest is. So I don't want to convince anyone that they have to go to computer science. It definitely, you need to be interested in this field and you need some background in mathematics is probably the strongest indicator whether you will be good in computer science. But I know many students who are good in mathematics and they don't understand computers because it is its own way in how to think about um, the world. And yeah. Okay, uh, well, it looks like we have like a few minutes left. Uh, we do have, I guess, one question that just came in. So uh, this is like not related uh, any way to engineering, but just a more general in like students in university. Uh, so the question is, how much time do you believe your average students spend studying and doing assignments uh, during the week uh, in university? Yeah. Um, so Waterloo is a very tough university. And so the schedule that the first year, well, so first of all, I'm just impressed by the average that the students have that get into Waterloo. And so you have high 90s as the entrance average for software engineering, computer engineering, and I think soft, uh, computer science. So the bar to get into computer science and in this field is very high, and you're all high achievers. So you're used to studying hard, working hard, and the schedule is very packed. So you'll have lots of lectures to attend, tutorials, lab sessions where you have um, actual electronic equipment that you need to work in. And so again, I don't, I don't get exposure to how the undergraduate population really lives here. But I think there is maybe less free time than you would hope for. And so you really need to be able to focus on that. Nice aspect here is that, again, you have three months of academics, one month of final exams, then four months of industry experience. And then industry is usually a bit different where they put more focus on um, work-life balance. I come from a European university background where university was very different. So it was much more this university aspect that you really have a broad education where it's not so focused and so, so tightly packed as in Waterloo. And so this general education aspect in Canada gets maybe a bit lost. Um, but yeah, that's the trade-off between wanting you to be able to go to industry very quickly. You need a lot of material to be able to be productive in industry after just four months of doing courses. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So uh, I guess uh, I guess that wraps it up uh, for today. So uh, again, thank you so much, uh, Professor Daito, for coming. Uh, today and actually speaking to uh, to speaking to the club today. 
Um, and I hope everyone did enjoy it who came in. Um, and yeah, if you have any remaining questions, you can, you can for the members, you can DM us on Instagram at Highland Engineering um, or and stay tuned for our next lesson next week in person. Uh, where we'll be continuing uh, C++ as well as uh, in hardware. Uh, and again, thank you, uh, Professor Daita, for coming today. And thank you, everyone, for coming. And I can send you the slides. I saw that um, somewhere here, so I'll send them to Ms. Simis, and they can, can be posted or used as PDFs. And right. thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.